We'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast was recorded, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to Elders past and present. This episode contains discussion of suicide. If this raises any issues for you, support is available through the links and phone numbers in the show notes. Hi, Ant here. I hope your 2024 is off to a good start. We'll be back with more amazing stories from the 17th of Jan. But until then, we're taking a look back at some of our incredible head game guests. In this episode, you'll hear from two men who have faced some very tough battles. My first guest is Pat Farmer. Pat is an ultramarathon runner who has pushed himself to the absolute limits on many occasions. I sat down with him to hear about his 2011 run from the North to the South Pole. I'll tell you one story I'll never forget. I remember there was this one day, it was a particularly tough day for me, and uh, I got, I finally got inside my tent, and we had like a neoprene face mask that went over our face. We had, of course, um, hats, beanies, um, um, balaclavas, all the rest of the gear, the goggles, everything that you needed to keep the conditions away from your skin. Um, I finally got inside my tent that night. I uh, when I say night, it's twenty four hour sunlight, of course. Uh, dug some snow, got some fresh snow to be able to boil up for for water. Finally got inside my tent, got inside my sleeping bag, uh, and I remember I would peer out of my sleeping bag and look at my jacket, my clothes there uh, inside the tent, and they were just covered in snow and ice. And that was the stuff that you were going to put on to get warm for the start of the next day. So to look at that and to think that the only sanctuary that I had was inside my sleeping bag. And I'm, anyway, I'm inside this bag and um, the night seemed to go so fast. It was ready the next morning. The wind was howling outside and there's this incredible saying that they have and, and, and it is, the storm is always loudest from inside the tent, which basically means that whenever you take on anything in life, it always seems so much tougher until you actually get out there and you start to do it. And then when you get on, you get out there and you get on with it, well, you know, it is what it is, but you accept it and it's not so bad as they're preempting the fear of it all. So anyway, um, my crew were, were packed up and ready to go and I had overslept and I, 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 I got up and I got out and I started to get myself dressed and I'm racing around my tent and I'm looking for my neoprene face mask and I couldn't find it anywhere. And in my haste the day before, I didn't realise, but it, it had come off my, I'd taken it off my face and I'd, I was grabbing something out of my sled and I'd left it on the sled, which meant that the next morning I looked out, I peered outside the tent and there was my face mask covered in snow and ice at the end. I quickly grabbed it and brought it back inside the tent. And I tipped some warm water over the top of it that I'd, I'd just boiled in a thermos. Uh, and I got some of the snow and ice off and it was still pretty hard and I was jumping on it. I put it on my face and as soon as I put it on my face, it just stuck to my face as soon as I went outside of the, outside of the tent. Uh, and um, I packed everything up. That morning, after two hours of, of traversing with our sleds, pulling our sleds along, we got behind this little bit of a, a, a nice crater uh, and the guys had pulled out the olive oil and they, they, they got that out and they got their little bit of chocolate out and they were having their, their, their break. Uh, and I was struggling to get this mask off my face because it was stuck to my face. And the guys are saying to me, come on, Pat, you have to hurry up. We've got to get going, you know. And I was trying to peel this thing off from my ear. I couldn't get it around, around my ear and off. Uh, and in my haste, I was even trying to push some food up my nose, in, in through my nose to get it in into the back of my throat. But of course, my nose had all icicles in it. It was difficult to get anything into there any other way. So what I ended up doing was I ripped the mask and when I ripped the mask, all the skin came off the front of my face and my nose from one side to the other. Then my face started bleeding and then the bleed, the blood congealed and froze on my face straight away and I could see this skin on my mask. I grabbed the olive oil through back as much as I could and then I put the mask back on my face and I have to tell you for the rest of that day my face just throbbed 
throbbed with pain uh, and I was in a world of hurt and I was wondering, you know, what the hell I was doing there. You have to keep in mind, I was only on day 10 of a journey that was going to take me almost 20,000 kilometres uh, from one end of the earth down through to the other and we we're still in the North Pole. Uh, just on day 10 of a 39-day trek across the North Pole itself. Uh, And so, you know, I was dealing with all of this. Then I just sort of pushed on. I got inside my tent that night and I was thinking to myself, I was looking at EPIRB and I was thinking so much about just pressing that button and relieving this pain for good. Uh, And I'd come to the realisation that I would rather die than to quit. And I know that's not a good thing to say, and I know it's not a healthy thing for me to be speaking to your listeners about, but I was actually in that frame of mind. I just, I felt so committed to where I was and what I was doing that I couldn't possibly give up. And I was more prepared to just die than, than that to happen. So with that in mind, I grabbed my satellite phone, uh, and these things don't always work as you would know, but I, this was a rare occasion and I sent a message off to both my daughter and my son that were both in boarding school back in Australia and I sent the same message to both of them and the message simply said, this is dad, uh, I don't know how much more of this I can take, I'm going through an incredible amount of uh, difficulty with this run. I want you never to forget to be a leader because the world is looking for people to lead. I love you, goodbye. And that was all I, I, I sent in the message. I sent it off and I didn't expect an answer. And I was thinking about just walking outside the tent, just laying down in the snow and just closing my eyes. Um, I was just, it, it, it was just so incredibly painful. Then, like a miracle, I actually got a reply and a reply came from my daughter, and um, my daughter said, uh, sent me back a, a text message and said, oh, Dad, um, all of my friends are watching you. I'm watching you. We love you. We know you can do this. Please don't give up. And uh, then I just started crying my eyes out. I, it brought me back to reality. What I had been contemplating um, was not just, it was a very selfish thing to be thinking about. But I was in that much pain, I didn't know any other way out. And then, as you would know, boys and girls are completely different. My son actually sent me back a message and my son's <laughs> message was completely different. I'm intrigued different. with this one. <laughs> my son sent me back a message and said, Dad, you're in the North Pole. Of course it's cold. Man up. <laughs> <laughs> AFL star Jason McCartney was holidaying in Bali when his life changed forever. It was 2002 and a terrorist attack took place in the bar where he was spending the night with his friends. The physical and psychological toll was immense, not only for Jason, but his loved ones too. Once I'm back in Australia, you feel safe. Mm -hmm. The best medical facilities, you know you're going to get outstanding treatment. So... And then I'm flying to the Alfred Hospital and I was a bit naive at all. I thought, okay, I'm back in Melbourne. I'm at the Alfred. I'll get the very best care. But what I didn't understand is when I got to the Alfred, that's real danger states because you're just deteriorating. I thought I'm comfortable now. I'll get the best. So that's when straight into um, surgery, this was multiple operations for the actual skin grafts because they couldn't do that in Bali or Darwin. Um, And then into intensive care after that. So the operations, it would have been within sort of 24, maybe 48 hours after all the surgery for the skin grafts. Um, they did talk about this opportunity. If I was struggling with my breathing, they could help me with this. And they talked about this tube and pretty stubborn, determined by nature. And I didn't want to have a bar of that. So I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. But I do remember one night and Nerissa was by my, by my bed sort of day and night and she just went home. We didn't live too far from where the hospital was. And she just went home for a few hours to get some rest. And when she left, I just said to the, uh, the ICU nurses, I'm, I'm, I'm actually struggling with my breathing. So they whipped into action straight away. The tube was the incubation, the medical induced coma. And, um, that's, that was me for the next week. So obviously Narissa comes back, my mom and dad, shock horror. 
And I've got some, my father-in-law took some photos and at the time I'm thinking, what are you doing? But it's actually, it's nice to have it to look back on it because I talk about it a lot when people see this photo of me pretty much mummified because of the extent of the burn injuries, um, uh, tubes hooked up to me everywhere. They think about the pain I'm in when I show this to people, but I, I can guarantee and I tell them I'm in no pain because the medications, mm-hmm. the drugs, that's, that's why they put you in that. That gives you a chance that to state, actually, yep. your body to, to, to re- and fight this. What I can never quantify though, I'm in no pain. So everyone thinks you're in pain. No, I'm not. What on earth is the pain like for your fiance, uh, my brothers, uh, mum and dad? Because the uncertainty of first, probably for the first, after going into the induced coma, the first 24 hours, would, would I actually survive? But then beyond that, as I started to stabilise, is okay, physically and mentally, what will I be like when I come out and, and how long is this going to be? So the pain with them, I can never begin to imagine being in their situation. And do you think that, that helped you? cope or you know take your mind off of what was actually going on with your body when yeah. you when you flip that onto onto Absolutely. your loved ones and onto you know it's it almost takes takes it off of off of the actual source itself because yeah. just being an induced coma mate that's how you're deteriorating yeah that's life-saving treatment you know you know that now i, I know that through my military career yeah you know that's the, that's pretty serious before you know you're not here anymore yeah they're the critical crucial moments um and you've got your family by your side did that that seemed like it really really got you through it's, oh it's, yeah absolutely knowing that um you know just that family support and then more broadly what i realized a bit later on in the recovery just my work being an afl footballer so not only my football club but just the just the general support of all AFL supporters and the well wishes. So it gives you so much reason and want to, to fight and recover. Um, I would say probably for me, the, the toughest period was after coming out of the coma. Yeah. Because for a couple of days after that, you just, your mind's all over the shop because of the dosage of that medication. So um, the hallucinations and it just, some of the weird things that were going on and and probably for me that felt that that period then felt to me like it was worse than what it was like being caught up in the explosion hear both of these amazing stories from jason mccartney and pat farmer in full now i've linked the episode details in the show notes thank you so much for listening to head game i'm heading to australia very soon come and see me on my fear bubble tour tickets are on sale now from Ticketek or linked in the show notes. See you next week.